When we talk about beyond visual range combat, we're talking about using weapons with a very large effective range. The area that these weapons reach is called the Weapon Engagement Zone, or WES. Whenever we talk about a weapon's WES, it's not a single universal number. In fact, it changes based on several factors. So what are those factors, and what's the secret to get the most out of a missile's range? We'll answer those questions in this video. There are four factors that affect a missile's performance that I call the four A's. Aspect, altitude, angle, and airspeed. We touched on these in an earlier video in this series. In this video, we'll talk about how to maximize these values. But first, I want to take a moment to go over some of the terminology we'll be using. Here are the three air-to-air -air missiles most commonly used on Soviet and Russian fourth-generation fighters. The name in parentheses is what the Russian military calls these missiles. However, I'll be using the names given by NATO, which are on the left. These are known as reporting names, and it's just a way to get everyone in the various NATO countries to use the same terminology. If you have trouble remembering the difference between the three missiles here, there's a little trick that helps me keep them straight. Think of them as FOX-1, FOX-2, and FOX-3, which are the NATO brevity codes for air-to-air -air missile use. That's each weapon's mode of operation, with FOX-1 meaning it requires radar illumination from the launch aircraft for guidance, FOX-2 meaning it passively follows the infrared signature given off by the target, and FOX-3 uses its own built-in radar to actively provide the illumination for guidance. The AA-10 actually comes in four sub-variants named A, B, C, and D by NATO. The A and C models are the radar-guided models. B and D actually use infrared seekers, so they would technically be FOX-2 missiles if they were used by NATO forces. The C and D are longer-range versions of their respective types. In case you're wondering, the reason for these various seekers is to increase probability of kill. In this video, we talked about how the PK covers a wide variety of parameters. Firing the same missile twice under the exact same parameters doesn't really increase PK. If one missile under those conditions would miss, then so would two. So the Soviet solution to the problem was to build that variety of parameters right into the missiles themselves. That way, two AA-10s with different seekers could be fired back to back with an increase in PK. Out of all these missiles, the AA-10C has the longest range in our sim, so we'll focus on that one. In the intro video for this series, we used 13 miles as the WES for the AA-10C since that was the longest range available for a stern shot. For a shot taken from the target's forward arc, that range would go all the way up to 29 miles. This represents aspect, the first of our four A's, with higher aspect equating to a higher range. The takeaway here is that the probability of a kill goes down as a target turns away. But more importantly, the heart of the WES, where the kill probability is the highest, also shrinks. You can never count on an opponent to present the best aspect to you for the entirety of your missile's flight. Just like you, he wants to survive and is going to maneuver accordingly. So if your intent is to just get him to turn away, and this is a perfectly valid tactic in some cases, then launching at max range on a high aspect target is acceptable. But if you absolutely need that kill and are willing to accept the risk that comes with getting closer, then get that target into the heart of a stern wes. If you know the enemy stern wes and have a weapon that can beat that range, then your best option is just firing before reaching a safe abort range. It's called a short skate, and we cover that tactic in this video. Whichever way you decide to go, just remember that the final decision should be based on how much risk you're willing to take. In our example, when we had the same two aircraft flying at the same speed and aspect, but now flying at 20,000 feet, the range of the WES dropped. That stern wedge shrank to just 10 miles, and when we moved down to 10,000 feet, that dropped even further to 7.5 miles. The takeaway here is that at low altitudes, you're going to see ranges that seem ridiculously short. When chasing a low-level bandit, you're more likely to see misses, even at close range. So an 8-mile shot, which is practically a guaranteed hit at 25,000 feet, could easily run out of energy on a stern aspect target at only 1,000 feet. This is part of the reason for specialized low-altitude, high-speed strike aircraft like the Thunder Chief, Tornado, and Viggen. 
Another thing to keep in mind is what happens to the missile when the target is at a different altitude. With our same two aircraft flying at 550 knots true airspeed, but at different altitudes, we get this result. Even though gravity was assisting the missile, the higher density of the air on the way down actually lowers the effective range. And in this case, we went from a 13 mile whiz down to 11 and a half miles thanks to the increased drag on the missile. Shooting up also lowers range. Even with lower drag from decreased air pressure, our wedge shrank. It went down to about 10 miles when launching from an altitude of 20,000 feet at a target that was up at 30,000. The two things to remember here is that higher altitude increases performance and co-altitude shots will give you the largest ways. Speed also has an effect. Increasing the closure rate from 0 to 100 knots between shooter and target increased range by about 10%. So a 10 mile stern wedge would become 11 miles. Changing the pitch angle will also affect the wedge, but there's an interesting side effect we need to talk about. With zero degrees of pitch, which is flying level with the horizon, the AMRAM barely missed the stern shot taken at 15 miles. But when I added in 15 degrees of pitch, it could catch up to a target 18 miles away. That by itself is a 20% increase in range, but that's not the real power behind increasing pitch angle. To better understand what's happening, we need to watch the missile in flight. In real life, there isn't a camera that can follow a missile's path, but we can do this in DCS. When we do, we'll notice some things about our missile's flight performance. The missile's pitch tells us its speed and remaining kinetic energy. When the nose starts to rise, it's slowing down and is increasing angle of attack to stay airborne. Speed can be turned into maneuvers and range, so when it runs out of it, it can no longer chase its target. If that nose starts to point towards the horizon or even above it, then there's a high likelihood it won't ever reach the target. You can help to counteract this problem with pitch angle. When you pitch up to launch a missile, you're helping it by doing two things. One is you're sending the missile higher into less dense air for most of its journey to the target. This will help preserve its limited kinetic energy for the final phase of the attack. Once it's near the target, it now has this nose low profile where the missile is diving on its prey. With the assistance of gravity, it can do more maneuvering before it runs out of energy. So if you pitch up, you increase the overall size of the WES by a small amount. But if you think of this area within the WES as the region where the missile can hit a maneuvering target, then increasing pitch angle grows this area dramatically. That's the real purpose behind increasing pitch angle. So how does this all come together to form a WES that's useful to a pilot? The numbers are run through this formula by a computer to present a final number in the range of 0 to 100 called Theoretical Instantaneous Probability of Weapons Intercept, or TIPWI. This is the percentage chance of a missile hitting a target at the moment of launch. It's also a very precise estimate of PK or probability of kill, which is the percentage chance of a hit throughout the entire time of flight. This formula can be broken into two parts. This first part is based upon antenna train angle, which we covered in this video. Basically, it's the angle off the nose of the launch platform. The second part is the weapons range model, which is a big chart centered on the aircraft's angle off tail, or AOT. Here's how that looks visually. The antenna train angle is a good analog for closure rate. Zero ATA will have a higher closure rate than anything over 90. With AOT, you can go from zero all the way at the tail to 180 at the target's nose. Each of these degrees has an entry in the weapon range model table with four values labeled R1 through R4. These will be range values with R1 being the missile's maximum range for that angle and R4 being the minimum range. They're also known as Rmax and Rmin. In the middle are R2 and R3 known as the no escape ranges. This is the region where the missile has the most kinetic energy and the target is least likely to be able to outmaneuver the missile. An important thing to understand here is that the range between R2 and R3 has the highest probability of an intercept. Going above or below that lowers the chance. Remember that a missile starts slow and builds up speed until its rocket motor runs out of fuel. Then it starts to slow down again. 
For a missile, speed is a currency exchange for maneuverability, so it has the most to spend at the peak. Before and after that peak, it has less ability to chase a maneuvering target. This is also the same region that we talked about earlier when we covered how increased pitch angle increases this inner area of the WES. All of these R values have a percentage associated with them. That percentage is plugged into the formula for WRM. So let's say we have an ATA of 45. That gives us 50% on this side of the formula. And when we look up our WRM for this range and angle off tail, we get a 90%. 50% of 90 is 45. So our overall tip we is 45%. But what if we turn the shooter directly towards the target? Now the ATA part of the formula goes up to 100, and the final tip we becomes 90%. Another way to look at it is this visualization. You can practically see the missile speed profile drawn out. At maximum and minimum ranges where the speed is lowest, you can see the tip we is 0%. But it's 100 where the speed peaks. The takeaway here is twofold. First, to maximize your probability of a kill, you want your target in the heart of the wes. The closer it is to an edge, the more likely it is to find a way out. This includes the sides and the edge closest to the launching fighter. Second, pointing your fighter's nose at the target also increases probability of a kill. So far in this video, we talked about balancing aspect and range to maximize the probability of a kill. We also talked about airspeed and more importantly, pitch angle. Ignoring pitch angle is one of the most common mistakes I see, so make sure to take advantage of that factor. Lastly, we went over how tip we is calculated, which is what a fighter's computer is doing when it tells the pilot when to shoot. You maximize tip we by getting the target into the heart of the WES and getting the nose onto the target's azimuth. Armed with this knowledge, you can get the most performance out of your BVR ordnance. So, I hope this was useful, and thanks again for watching.